couple of preliminary remarks. The chairman had something to say about consultants. I suppose he does know that I've been a consultant for 52 years of my life <laughs> with doing some other things like politics in between. Uh, but there you are. He probably didn't mean any harm. <laughs> um, I want to say that Joe has got it right this year. He sometimes arranges these meetings without finding out if, when I'm on holidays. Last year he made that awful mistake. This year he got it right. I'm glad to be here. They got me here just before I go on holidays on Friday. I want more seriously to say that I'm extremely honored to have been asked to open this 30th uh, meeting. These are extraordinary meetings, and they exert considerable and positive influence more than any other summer school. And this year's topic is well chosen and it stimulated me to put down some thoughts which I shall address occasionally with some passion, but never with malice. Uh, so if I get heated, it's because I really am concerned about these issues, but I bear no malice to anybody. To reform our republic, we need first of all to be clear on what are the fundamental weaknesses that have led us into our present deep crisis. Looking them, leaving aside for other fora the question of how this crisis came about, I see two deep-seated and in some measure interrelated problems as lying behind this crisis. First, moral defects in our society, and second, deficiencies in the quality and effectiveness of our political system. We are where we are, I believe, because of a combination of these two critical deficiencies. The moral defects that I should seek to identify in the 15 minutes allotted to me, I may take, I may take 20, are, I believe, a reflection of the fact that in some key respects our society has remained relatively primitive and notably ill-adjusted to the needs and pressures of the modern world. It lacks some key qualities essential to a successful state. We call ourselves a republic and have done so for the last 59 years, I think. But true republicanism, civic republicanism, is defined as involving a pluralist state that is marked by the public engagement of its citizens with the interest of the common good. That, I think, is the standard definition of political philosophers. Since we won our independence almost 90 years ago, our prevailing political ideology has, until recently anyway, been marked by an inward-looking unicultural nationalism that has been preoccupied solely with the Gaelic Roman Catholic ethos of one part of the people of our island, and has also been dominated by local and sectional interests rather than by an active uh, sense of the common good of Irish society as a whole. And that hitherto prevailing ideology is, of course, the very antithesis of true republicanism. Commitment to the common good of the Irish people as a whole has all too often been undermined by the intense localism of our society, the practice of persistently putting the interests of one's locality before that of the country as a whole, it's also been affected by a prevalent tolerance of low standards, both in public life and frequently also in the quality of the service we give through our work in our particular uh, areas of our activity. And it has been morally damaged by the quite extraordinary scale of tax evasion in recent decades, by the self-employed and many, many professional people, the very group we might have expected to offer positive moral leadership in civic republicanism. Payment of taxes has not been seen positively as the way in which our state is kept going and resources more fairly distributed, but rather as an unjustified and exploitative levy imposed by a, a, a tyrannical regime for whose presence and power we, despite being the electorate, accept no responsibility. Particularly striking is the intense localism of our society, involving a primordial emotional attachment to a county or even to a small part thereof, that seems to be given precedence over loyalty to the state, which embodies our whole society. It should be clear that local loyalties are positive factors in themselves, 
Indeed, can be and often are essential building blocks of larger loyalties to a province or state. But when they're given priority over the larger loyalty, they can undermine the cohesion of the larger unit. That <coughs> even a county, maybe too big an area to command local loyalty, was born in on me, and 45 years ago, as a consultant, <laughs> I was offered 500 pounds, which is about 20,000 pounds of today's money, which I'd be very glad to get at that time, to prepare a development plan for Castle Bar. Naively, I suggested that the public interest might be better served by extending this study to the whole county of Mayo at no greater cost. But the consequent row between Castle Bar, Ballina, and Westport led the whole project being cancelled to my great financial disadvantage. <laughs> Extreme localism can be a great impediment to the common good of the Irish people as a whole. First of all, it can lead to pressure on politicians, to which they all too frequently succumb, to distort the optimal allocation of resources so as to favour areas which can exercise political clout, usually through having one of their TDs in Cabinet. This, in turn, has led many, many others to see Cabinet ministers primarily as representatives of a constituency rather than as members of a national government responsible to the electorate of the good government of the entire state. A particular manifestation of this is the way in which, after the announcement of a new government following an election, the media report which constituencies have got a Mercedes. <laughs> Incidentally, I've come across this same state car complex in other countries, in Kazakhstan and Zambia. <laughs> and some of my experiences in recent years as a consultant in developing countries have led me to see our Irish localism as a native Irish form of African tribalism. <laughs> low standards, tolerance of low standards. Tolerance of low standards has in recent decades been a damaging feature of our national life. Our first two governments were both led by very able and dedicated men who were persons, people of great personal integrity because of the promise of our national revolution and because revolutions often do throw up people of great ability and character. And in our case, um, they retain their sense of duty to the whole people of our country right through their lives. They weren't corrupted by seeking, looking for more money or like that. They did their work for whatever the pay was. And even Mr. Dolaire reduced it from 1,500 a year to 1,000 a year for ministers. Um, and uh, the question of what they would earn never struck any of them at the coming ahead of being a foil over those many decades. Although they were not economically very literate and made some bad economic mistakes, the common sense of these men would certainly have prevented them from engaging in the kind of lunacy that led our government in this decade to destroy our competitiveness by inflating an economy that was locked into a monetary zone and was overheating in conditions of full employment. And then, subsequently, artificially boosting a construction boom, which had been damped down, and allowing our banks the freedom to destabilize our entire economy without <coughs> adequate regulation. To prove my point, I have only to mention the names of earlier famously prudent ministers and civil servants, such as Ernest Blythe, Paddy McGilligan, Sean McEntee, Jim Ryan, Sean Lamass, and civil servants like Joseph Brennan, J.J. McGilligan, and Ken Whitaker. The mere recital of that list of famous names demonstrates beyond argument how far the quality of the government of our state has fallen back during the past half century. The lack of accountability for poor performance. A striking feature of our state is that despite repeated evidence of incompetence and neglect by a minority within the public service, and it's only a minority, unless there's actual dishonesty or fraud, no one is ever held to account for such failures. All too often we've had to live with those who've let us down badly being promoted instead of being sanctioned. Finally, there's been a very widespread reluctance to face the fact that tax evasion involves stealing from everyone else, but particularly from less well-off in our society. Why? Because the billions of taxes that are not paid by evaders have to be found by increasing the level of taxation above what would have been needed to be levied if all paid their share, thus hitting everybody else. And because of widespread resistance to income taxation, this extra revenue 
has had to be raised by taxes and spending, which shifts the burden all the time away from the better off and towards the less well off. That has been the record for the last 20 years particularly. Widespread tax evasion has been a major corrupting force in our society, despite which it has never received, to my knowledge, or recollection, the attention it should have done from those in our principal church who offer moral guidance to our people every week. I'm almost minded to ask, but I won't do it. People put hands up, anybody who's heard, heard a sermon against that great moral evil in the course of their lives. I won't ask. Put your hands up. <laughs> Moreover, until the last couple of years, our people have shown considerable tolerance of actual financial corruption, enthusiastically re-electing some of the minority of politicians, and they are only a minority, known to be and widely accepted as having been financially corrupt. The local political system we inherited in 1922 was, of course, marred by jobbery and financial corruption, which unhappily have become a widespread feature of a local government system until 1920, have been dominated by the Irish Parliamentary Party. This was all cleaned up by our first government, which by establishing the Local Appointments Commission in 1926, ended the payment of bribes to councillors voting on public appointments. At that time, a dispensary doctor job cost £1,000 in bribes, about 50000 in today's terms. That was all cleaned up in 1926. And that cleaned up system, well, criticised at the time by the opposition, was endorsed by Fianna Fáil after they came to power in 1932, sharing as they did the commitment to good government and to integrity. Unfortunately, it has since learned, the vesting of planning decisions in local authorities in 1963 reopened the potential for bribery at local level in certain counties. Moreover, political jobbery, I have to say, often involving grave injustice to more worthy candidates, thus wrongfully excluded from employment, soon re-emerged in our state, and thus unhappily survived in those areas where uh, our public employment writ does not run. That miscellaneous group, which consists of used to be rate, payer, uh, rate collectors, vocational teachers, that's gone, I think, judges and, and government messengers, who were never included in this local appointment and civil service commission provision. Within the public service, moreover, the Buggins turn practice has allowed people of evident inadequate competence to be appointed to some key positions, with, as we know, disastrous consequences for our state in some instances. Our society has also been damaged by a deep division between the capital and its more rural hinterland. Almost 90 years after independence, Dublin, the former centre of colonial power, is still viewed negatively in much of the rest of the country, where it has never become fully accepted as our own capital city. Rural tolerance of, and even support for tax evasion, has extended well beyond those who actually engaged personally in this practice. As we can see from the results of the last general election in North Tipperary, where a candidate who had been shown to have evaded taxes and was a government minister topped the poll with almost 30% of the first preference votes. This local reaction has been generally seen, I think rightly, as reflecting widespread antipathy to what is seen as the Dublin government. Interestingly, this is not mirrored by any similar anti-rural attitude amongst Dubliners in the region around Dublin, Dublin County, Kildare, Meath and Wicklow. Um, perhaps because at least half, one half of Dubliners either come from rural areas or their parents came from rural areas. And there's still a sense of a, a, a identity, a sense of, of a common interest between Dubliners, therefore, and rural Ireland. <clears throat> And although 40% of the proceeds of income tax paid in the Dublin region, that's Dublin, East and Dare, Wicklow, amounted to about 4.5 billion a year, is transferred annually to the rest of the country, there's no resentment in the Dublin region at the scale of this income transfer. Incidentally, I hesitate to say this and don't throw tomatoes or anything at me, but 380 million, or almost 8.5% of this sum, goes to Donegal with 5.5% of the population outside the Dublin region. The clear evidence, I'll come now to reforming politics, the clear evidence of gross political incompetence in our economic governance during the past decade calls for a radical reform of our political system. 
We simply cannot afford to continue with a political system that during the past decade left us with a set of politicians in government, and it has to be said in opposition also, I'm not making a distinction between them, there's no evidence the opposition, they in fact followed the government and did not criticise the government for their policies, who either failed to observe that from near the start of the present decade our economy was being driven onto the rocks, that they did understand what was happening, lacked the guts to shout stop. I find it totally unacceptable that from near the start of the present decade not one of our ministers was able to observe that by more than doubling the rate of increase in current spending in the period of full employment, we were also more than doubling inflation. And having brought us into the Eurozone in 1998, they seem to have failed to grasp that by so doing, they had ruled out devaluation, with the result that by generating inflation far beyond that of the rest of the Eurozone, the competitiveness of our economy was fatally undermined, our exports declined, and we lost one-fifth of our share of the exports of developed countries. And all that even before they started to stoke up our housing bubble and fatally failed to secure regulation of our banks. To be blunt about it, politicians capable of such stupidity should never have been in government. And I'm not, I'm not making the distinction between government and opposition. It's not a particular point, because the opposition did not rise to the occasion by criticising that. They went along with it. And if we don't now radically transform our political system, to ensure an adequate level of future governance, we will deserve to remain a failed state. The vision of my double business interests of some of the costs of political organization and of politicians' election campaigns, which creates a political dependency relationship that risks biasing recipients, uh, in political recipients in favor of business interests. Reform of this process is part of the Green Fin of Oil program, but disturbingly has been given a lower priority and stag hunting and dog breeding. <laughs> Removal of this potential source of abuse is now urgent, especially since the at least partial devolution of campaign costs to individual uh, candidates has in some cases been used to enhance their personal income. Uh, when the system broke down after the late 80s and party funding began to be replaced by uh, candidates looking for money directly themselves, some of the discoveries is a way of making money. They got so much additional money in order to stand for election, they ended up up to £50,000 better off. So elections are made of making money for them personally. Only a very small number. But nonetheless, it's a kind of abuse should never exist in a democracy. Finally, I don't see how we can ever get an adequate class of politician unless we change our electoral system. No one's explained how our present system could be used to produce a vitally necessary radical improvement in the general quality of our politicians. But that hasn't stopped some political theorists who perhaps have not yet grasped or absolutely vital to the need for competent, competent economic leadership from urging us to stay with the present electoral system, which has so notably failed to provide more than a handful of economically competent politicians. On this key issue, I urge you to listen later this week, but I'm happy that I cannot be here, to practicing politicians like Noel Dempsey and Pat Carey, I'm sure there are other parties as well, but I know that from personal discussion with them that they're very concerned to change our system. I haven't heard quite so enthusiasm from people elsewhere, but I'm sure they exist in the other parties. We desperately need, therefore, to remoralize and thus modernize our entire society and also to remove obstacles to the entry into politics of many more people with the necessary personal capacity and the necessary courage to prevent any future repetition of the two financial and economic crises precipitated in the late 1970s and again early in the present decade by a combination of political responsibility and gross incompetence. Now, I don't want to hold up the address by the Deputy Chief Minister of Northern Ireland, Mark McGuinness. I was told to speak for 15 minutes. Uh, maybe we'll run up, but not by much. For me, by very little. Um, <laughs> as always, there's much more to say, and I could say, but I shall now close my remarks. Reserving, however, the right to participate in whatever discussion may follow our next speaker's remarks and hoping that some of the issues I have raised, somewhat aggressively, to stir things up, it's my job, uh, may be discussed here before I leave, have to leave at lunchtime on Tuesday. Thank you very much. <laughs>